Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your host and friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am delighted that you've joined me here today because I have two folks joining me that I can't wait to learn about one of their journey and how it involves the rest of us. So um, before we jump into our show today with Sarah and Ellen, Um, If you're new here, welcome aboard, and if you want to learn more about the work that the Gardener's Workshop is doing, our home base is over at thegardenersworkshop.com, where you'll find all of our online courses, our online garden shop, and a ton of free resources. So you can check us out over there, including connecting to our sister podcast, Seed Talk. Um, And we just have a lot of great stuff. We are passionate about helping other people. you know, find their niche and what they want to do, whether that means you're a home gardener or if you want to start a flower-based business and where you want to go with that. So today I am thrilled to have my good friend, Ellen Frost, back here with me. Hi, Ellen. Hi, happy to be here. And we have a new friend to me, Sarah Strauss. And Sarah is going to, she is why we're here today, because we want to hear about her journey and how this kind of developed, because I think it's a super sweet story of, you know, you just never know where things are going to lead, right? So hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi there, Lisa and Alan. So out of the gate, um, first, Ellen, for anybody, uh, for that one person in the world that might not know who you are, Ellen, tell people <laughs> well, all about you and kind of how we met. Just give us a brief rundown. Sure. Uh, I'm Ellen Frost. I'm the owner of Local Color Flowers. We are a floral design studio located in Baltimore, Maryland, and we are in our 16th year in business. Oh my goodness. And we have been sourcing all of our flowers locally uh, all that time. So we do all the things that florists do, uh, but with local flowers. And Lisa and I met many years ago, I think at an ASCFG conference where we um, hit it off and remained friends over the years. And um, Lucky for me, I was um, invited to become a instructor for the Gardener's Workshop, and I now offer two courses um, as part of the Gardener's Workshop, one for florists, one for farmers, uh, both really great courses. If you want to check them out, you can find them on the website. Awesome. So, Sarah, um, before we dive into how this all happened, um, tell us kind of about a little, just a little bit about you, like before flowers. You know what I mean? Maybe like if you have a career or your family, what you want to want us to know. Sure. So I actually worked as a neonatologist, which is a doctor for critically ill newborns um, for um, between 10 and 20 years, um, depending on which stage of training you count as being (laughs) part of it. Um, And so in 2020, I have rheumatoid arthritis and it was just getting too painful to work the long hours and overnights and do lots of procedures and get the gloves on and off. And so I decided it was time to stop working, uh, doing that. Um, and it was kind of a bummer. (laughs) It was a big bummer. Um, and so I'd taken a class from Ellen before. So I just started getting flowers from Ellen, um, in her porch, uh, her bucket, um, local color flowers, bucket deliveries. And they just, just cheered me up so much in that hard time of having to stop work and being with all my friends. Um, it was really nice. All right. So you, like so many of us, had a real um, had a, a, a real passion career previously, right? Um, I can't tell you how many people that I know that are flower farmers today, that are cut flower growers in all different levels, that have come from other areas. Um, and so How did you, so you found Ellen through one of her, I mean, Ellen's business, which is a design studio located in Baltimore, Maryland. And I think that Ellen's business model for me is what every person dreams their flower florist shop is all about, but it doesn't really turn out to be that way when you're kind of a conventional florist because Ellen does fun stuff and Ellen fill in the blank here what kind of things do you do 
in your business beyond delivering flowers and buying local flowers? Sure. So a lot of our focus is bringing community members together with flowers as sort of the connecting piece. And so we offer floral design classes. And these are classes that are not geared for um, professional florists. These are really for regular people, people who are hobbyists, people who have never done anything with flowers before, but love them. Um, these are classes for them. We also offer um, something called Flower Club, which has lots of different events connected with it. Um, our main thing is Bloom Battle, which is an amateur floral design competition that we have out of the shop. We've done um, things like Flower Trivia Night. We've done a chopped style competition. Um, we have a book, a flower book club. So we we are always looking for ways to engage people in our community in unique and exciting and fun ways with flowers at the heart of what we're doing. And so one of those events is how she met, how Sarah came to know Ellen, right? So Sarah, just tell us what, what was it that you actually, what class was it that you took? I, I think it was how does, how to design with ranunculus. And I had actually never heard of ranunculus or seen a ranunculus or, and I didn't know anything about local flowers. I just knew about the conventional flowers that you get from florists that are shipped in from overseas. Um, and so that class was a big eye opener. She had a, a farmer, um, I think it was Laura Beth Resnick that was growing the ranunculus from Butterbee Farm. So she got to tell us about how she grew it. And then Ellen taught us how to arrange it. And just the vibe of the, of the class, which is so fun. Like you just, everyone there felt included, felt like they were having fun. It was not stressful. It just is a, it definitely feels like a community from the first time I walked in. So that's what you know kind what, of lured Ellen, me in. I'm just sitting here thinking, I'd like to come up there to one of those. Yes, I mean, you like, should. How Absolutely. good. And you know, something I was doing my reading this morning and one of the things that, one of the messages that came through to me, sometimes it is the most simplest thing that is the greatest achievement that we all just zoom right past. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I feel like for me and my business, that was seed starting. I just thought that I was the only person in the world that struggled with seed starting. And then to learn that the greater world also struggled with that. And I kind of rode that wave of just kind of not feeling like I had to make it fancy and to be extreme and to start hard to start seeds. I mean, I'm still teaching people how to start zinnias and sunflowers 25 yep. years later. And I think Sarah is a perfect example of how you cultivated that. Anybody out there that's listening to this podcast, and by the way, we do have a video you can watch over on YouTube if you're watching this on your podcast app and you can see our sweet faces and our backgrounds and just kind of makes just a little bit more interesting. Um, so Ellen, kudos to you. I think that is just one of the things that you bring to the table with your business model that we're all missing the boat on people that are, that want to have that flower shop vibe, you know? Yeah. All right. So Sarah met Ellen there. So Ellen kind of, um, Take us to the next step. What happened after you went to that class and fell in love with flowers and local? The funny thing is that when Sarah took that class, it was right before COVID. So um, everything changed when COVID hit. And that was really, like Sarah said, she can tell you a little bit more, but we really had to pivot our business model because a lot of the things that we did pre-COVID were not really... Uh, available to us anymore. We could not be doing in-person classes. We couldn't be doing events at the shop. Um, we just were not able to function, you know, just like everybody as we had been in the past. And so our first real big pivot was to start offering a flower subscription, which got delivered to people's homes from the first week of COVID. Like we started almost immediately. Um, offering people flowers at their homes because we knew that with the lockdowns, people couldn't go out people, you know, we just didn't know then. Right. Um, so these were flowers delivered to people's doors. And what we did was include a little video to help people understand what to do with their flowers. So a lot of people 
bought flowers for fun and to cheer them up and to have flowers in the house. But they were like, well, I don't really know what to do with these. And I can't come in for a class. So we just offered like a 10 minute, 15 minute little video to show them how to um, design their flowers. And Sarah was one of the people who joined the subscription right from the beginning. How smart was that? <laughs> right. Sarah, I was so I mean, impressed. I was so impressed with that, that like amazing quick pivot. And that time everyone was talking about different businesses. I was like, let me tell you about this business that's doing this amazing pivot. Um, kind of like an example for everyone else about what to do in this tough time. So Ellen starts dropping flowers off on your porch every week that she's got them with along with a video link to be able to see what to do with them. And then what happens next? Well, my whole family knows that I'm having this huge fangirl moment right now because they saw me do it. They know Ellen's voice and they know Lisa's voice and like they'll walk <laughs> in and be like, so you're listening to Ellen today or so you're listening to Lisa today. <laughs> so my whole family knows, even though they're not as much flower people, um, but I, I just liked these interesting local specialty flowers so much. I wanted to grow some. So it still in that first year of COVID in 2020, I started to grow cut flowers. Um, and I started actually watching YouTube videos from you, Lisa, um, about starting seeds and when to plant and, you know, what season was the right time to plant each thing. And then I read both of your books <laughs> and I continued to take lots of online classes from, from Ellen um, through the Gardener's Workshop and other Gardener's Workshop classes, as well as just all over the internet from other flower farmers and just to learn more in all this free time I suddenly had. <laughs> so wow. I grew I grew Costco dahlias the first year. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the most innocent purchases that just oh. lead us down a rabbit hole that we're so glad that we fell into, right? So Sarah, tell us about a little bit. So you gradually started growing more and more. And yes. so tell me just for my own personal information, which of our classes have you taken? I've taken 12 of your classes. I've taken, oh, the, please no. <laughs> it's crazy. I've taken the, the, your big flower farmer course and the Dave Dowling perennial course, both of Ellen's classes, the one for florists and the one for farmers. Um, cause the florist one came out first and I was hungry mm -hmm. for knowledge, even though I wasn't a florist, I just wanted to learn more. Um, I take in the one about structures, um, the yes. indoor structures. Um, we have a high tunnel now and a little propagation house, um, that the class helped me with. Oh, what else? The, the tools behind me, I grew on according to Dave Dowling's instructions in his perennial class. Um, so I think so. You probably classes. did you take the collectives also? Probably the collectives yes. one one. Yes. I'm just collectives thinking which other ones yep. there are. So I mean, Sarah, I I like you am one of those people that is like super hungry for information. I mean, sure. back of course when I started flower farming in the dinosaur times, we didn't even really have the internet. So I was like devouring books and magazines. And I can remember Joan becoming a master gardener and other master gardeners were bringing me these stacks of old magazines because that's really all we had. Right. So my kudos to you, I, kudos to you for education. I think, um, you know, if I had 500 bucks and I thought, should I save this money or should I invest in my education? I'm the person that steps back and said, if I save that money, I'll have two more dollars at the end of the year. If I spend that money, I can have 20 times that amount of money by the end of the year. And um, I just have so much respect for other people that have figured that out. You know, I mean, well, you've, you've got professional education, so you know that. So now I want to hear about um, what you're doing now. First off, do you have a farm name? So it's Strawberry Hill and our Instagram is at Strawberry Hill MD because we live in Maryland. Okay. Not because I was an MD, because <laughs> about, the, about the place. Because um, at Strawberry Hill was obviously taken and the farm came with that name. Um, so in our old house, we had about a quarter acre, maybe a little less than that, actually. And I had 20 raised bed gardens, like the wooden raised bed gardens, right. full of cut flowers and some vegetables. And uh, there, I was out of space. And my husband's like, this is not a farm. You can't have high tunnels showing from the front yard. Like not high tunnels, uh, uh, hoops and row covers showing from the front yard. So I said, well, we should get a farm then. And um, I have three stepdaughters and the youngest went off to college. And so we decided it was time to buy the farm. So now we live about 20 minutes north, which means my tulips are somehow six weeks later. So it must have been a very 
big 20 minutes <laughs> compared to my All old right. house is cold. So tell us more about your farm. So what I'd like to know is, so how big is your growing area? How much sure. do you grow on? Oh, so I go on a little less than half an acre um, is in cultivation and the rest is a lot of preservation and, and environmental um, purposes. And you have a couple of structures. Tell us how they came to be, what size they are and what you do in them. Sure. So um, we scooped our flower field out of our front meadow. So we have a big front meadow and a back meadow that are planted in um, native plants for pollinators and birds and generally wildlife habitat. So we took a little corner out of that and we did a deer fence around it um, because we have really a ton of deer pressure. They eat all the things they're not supposed to here. Um, Thankfully not dahlias for some reason, but they eat everything else. (laughs) Um, And then so we put that up last year and I really wanted to go ranunculus um, this year. So we, we bought a high tunnel that we put together ourselves. Actually, I put the plastic on completely by myself with no one else there. That day. <laughs> I think it's my biggest life accomplishment after running a marathon was putting on this plastic <laughs> by myself. Um, so we have a high tunnel from farmer's friend and it's 14 by, Oh no, it's 16 by 50. Sorry. And then yeah. we have a propagation house that's, kind of a shed, but it has a, a clear roof and it's all windows. Um, and that's uh, 14 by 30. Um, so, so those are really, really nice sizes. I mean, to not yeah. get overwhelmed. I mean, when I look at people that have just tons of structures, all I think about is what happens when it snows, who is out there getting all the snow off of them. <laughs> so I think that's a great choice. So Sarah, so how did it happen that you started selling flowers? I mean, who was your first customer? So Ellen was my first um, commercial cu- commercial florist customer. I did sell a few to some neighbors before that, um, but my first florist that I went and made the delivery and dropped my buckets off was to Ellen. So I was super excited. <laughs> I'd heard a rumor uh, that 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 she was full up and didn't need any more local flowers. Um, so. I, I waited like a year before I asked her and it was her class that gave me the, the confidence and courage to, to get in touch. So what are you growing? What kind of, I mean, are you growing a mix of perennials and bulbs and stuff or all annuals? Yes. What are you doing? I'm growing a big mix. Um, I really like the specialty flowers. So ranunculus and anemones are getting ready to bloom. Um, now I did a little indoor forcing of tulips um, and there's a forcing class on, um, Gardener's Workshop too. So I forced some of some little grape hyacinths and things like that, just to see if I could do it. I did a whole bunch for Valentine's day, but just since then, I just have a few that uh, I cooled myself that weren't pre-cooled. So then we're growing, I, I grow lots of Lysianthus. Um, last year I grew 1000 from seed this year, I'm growing 2000 from seed. And I actually ordered some plugs in because I just wanted an insurance policy to be sure it would turn out because I'd had three years of growing Lysian or two or three years of going it really well, but being in a new place, I was nervous. So yeah. I ordered some plugs. Totally get it. Lisa, and now we have I'm a time. Just, I want to say this, Sarah's story, she is like really like um, underselling this story because she, this is amazing to go yeah. from having like basically never hearing about ranunculus <laughs> ever three years ago, four years ago, now producing winter flowers in Maryland, in a structure. It's amazing. It is. And I'll tell you, just like from our perspective, when Sarah emailed and said, oh, we're moving. So I'm going to have to cancel my subscription. Um, We're moving to a, a further away location where we didn't deliver. And I said, well, you know, that's great. Good for you. It's going to be a farm. That sounds terrific. Um, you know, thanks for being a great customer. Hope to see you, you know, hope to see you soon. And then a year later, she she sent me an email saying, I have winter tulips available for Valentine's Day. It blew my mind. Like (laughs) even growers that we have, that we have been working with for a decade have not attempted winter growing. And I think it is a tribute to Sarah, both like her, her passion for getting educated, but also just like, I don't know, commitment to doing a local thing that is just, it's amazing to me. It really, when we got the email and when Sarah said she thought we were filled up, 
you know, we do get a lot of requests from new farmers saying like, oh, I have, you know, something to sell. And oftentimes those new farmers are selling things that we already have a lot of like zinnias or, you know, something in season where we're like, well, everybody has that. We can't really take on another right. store. Right. Um, but one, we always need stuff in the winter. So there was no doubt that I, I needed stuff. Right. Um, but two, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of that relationship that was built early on from taking that first class, right? Like I know Sarah, she has been our customer. She has been, you know, in our lives for many years now. So it was a no brainer to me to say, yes, of course, we will try this product, even if it's just a trial, you know, of course we'll buy for the first time. And sure enough, the quality was great. The presentation was great. The delivery was great. It was like she had taken every single thing she learned put it into practice and it worked. It's just making my heart sing, you know? I mean, it's like, I can remember telling the story back when, you know, I read Lynn Bazinski's book mm -hmm. in the beginning, The Flower Farmer. And I literally, I can remember sitting down and rereading the part about going down to the florist. Yes. Like, I mean, I did exactly what Lynn told me and guess what? It worked, it worked. Like farm, you know, I mean, why reinvent the wheel, right? That's what my take is on from learning from people that have actually done it before you successfully, yes. right? Oh my gosh. So Sarah, I mean, I am just, even before Ellen was going to say that, it's like, I don't think you quite get what a great thing you've done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I, I, so who else are you selling to? I mean, do you have other florists? Are you doing a CSA? Sure. What else are you doing? So there's a, a wedding florist that does a la carte weddings um, that people pick up or she'll just drop off, but it's not a full service wedding. And I sell, sold uh, dahlias to her and then some winter tulips to her. Um, she happens to live on my street and I just saw a little sign. She was waiting for delivery. She doesn't have a sign outside of her house normally because she works out of her house. And I saw the sign. I was like, oh, it's a florist. I'll just walk up there. <laughs> um, and... and um, she really loved it. She got to see the farm last fall. Um, my mom was home doing hospice with me at the end of last summer. Um, so right when I was starting to have 20 buckets a week of Lysianthus and everything else, I couldn't do anything with them because I was here taking care of my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and after she passed in August and September, I kind of started getting organized again. And that's when I invited uh, Carrie to come see the farm um, from Lucky Penny Floral. And it was just her seeing the farm made me feel like, oh, maybe I am like, getting closer to ready because I still buy flowers from from Ellen and from other local farmers and to me their flowers still look better they look a little taller and a little bigger and a little better so I feel like I have a lot of oh, to go, but I, I'm gonna uh, say I love that, our flowers too that is imposter syndrome right there because I will tell you when Sarah brought over some tulips um maybe her second batch of tulips she said to me, I'm going to give you a couple of bunches at no charge because I think they're too short. But just in case you can use them for something, you know, I'm going to send them along. And I texted, I wasn't there. I texted Jess, our designer, and said, Sarah said, these shorter ones, we can just use them for ourselves or you can take some home. You know, the designers can take some home. And Jess said, I don't know what she's talking about. They're perfectly tall enough. They're perfectly fine. There is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with them. And we are definitely using them. So yes, I think Sarah might have an eye for like what looks great, but her stuff looks great. Yeah. I mean, there's nobody harder Thank on you. ourselves than us. Yes. You know, I mean, my niece, the best thing I ever did, Ellen, was to bring Kelly onto this business 12 years ago, my niece. I was just telling Stevie this morning, I am all, I'm the first one to say, oh, it's our fault. Oh, let yeah. me fix that. Let me give you another one. Let me give you your money back. And Kelly's like, wait a minute. <laughs> and so yeah. we all need that person in our life. And for you, Sarah, it is Ellen. She is your barometer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's true. And I mean, but. I will say that those of us that have that bar just are the ones that excel because of that, you know? So, yeah. all right. It helps have, have had all this education though. Like, I think I would have struggled growing snapdragons if I hadn't taken a class that said, this is how you grow snapdragons. This is how you grow lisianthus. The yeah. Cool Flowers book, I have two hard copies. And then I also have it on Kindle. So it's in my pocket all the time. 
tests. I'm like, which one is hardier? Like, is what should I put out first? I'll put out the Fox Glow first because it's hardier in a colder zone, and then I'll put out the next one. But uh, it really like having someone else who's done it already makes all the difference. It's really, I mean, there is definitely a pool of people in the world that really want to figure it out for themselves. You know what I mean? Put all the pieces oh, yeah. together and more power to them. But for me, um, I mean, I was trying to start a business. So I wanted to get from A to Z as quickly That's and it. as efficiently as possible. Right. All right. So, so Sarah, um, winter tulips, I can hardly believe it. I mean, Valentine's Day. Holy cow, that is just such a big deal. So the moral to this story is, Sarah, happened. how did you initially find Ellen? I mean, that first, did you see it on Facebook or, you know, how did you make that initial? I think, I think it was Instagram. I think that Instagram suggested Ellen to me. Um, I think I, I think I followed, I was looking for, actually, I was looking for vegetable CSAs. And then that put me down this rabbit hole. And I, and I saw that Lara Beth used to offer a, a flower CSA, but then didn't once I was looking for it. Um, and so um, it just got me down this local farms. And at the time, I think Two Boots Farms was switching from vegetables to flowers that year because it was COVID. And so I think that's what got me there, was yeah. looking for a vegetable CSA. So there are definitely good things that come out of social media when you go down the right spots. So Sarah, is there anything? So you've taken a bunch of classes. I'm sure you're a reader too, probably books. Um, And I don't know if I've told you guys, but I have a new book that I did. The the manuscript deadline is in April 1st. So that is not more than two weeks from now. And um, just really hoping to have like Cool Flowers, that quick reference type of book. And we'll be coming out here soon with the big announcement of what it's all about. But um, I just don't think we can ever complete our education, you know. Um, Ellen, what else do you want to add about the whole Sarah going from a flower enthusiast to now this superstar in our eyes, flower farmer? I I mean, to me, this is like what I always dreamed of without even knowing that I could imagine that, right? Like when we first started, there were no Baltimore city growers. We had only three total growers that we bought from for many years until I started meeting other growers. The idea that somebody could be um, educated, influenced, trained, um, excited by the work that we're doing is just like beyond it's, it's amazing. And it, I think it really is like, a it's a, it's a lesson for all of us to remember that you never know where, you know, these relationships and hobbies and, um, things that we're doing will lead us. We just, you can't imagine. I don't think if you told Sarah six years ago that she would no longer be a doctor and she would now be a commercial flower farmer, that that would be the case, but you just never know. And so always, I think, keeping ourselves open to new relationships, new training, new education, new ideas. Um, you just never know where it'll lead. It's so true. It's kind of like you just don't know how many people it's like sowing the seed. You know, you might not see that plant grow in front of you, but it's growing somewhere else. And I think it's just more becoming clearer and clearer to me. Um, Just when I hear stories from people that have how they learned about stuff. Right. Um, You know, I'm just I'm like you, Ellen. I'm just really floored that this is like our dream scenario that you, we, we finally get to meet it and Sarah, yeah. see it and see it in action. And, um, Sarah, I just think that your husband needs to buy you dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you burned that you should not have to cook today. And, um, you know, I mean, that is just so awesome. And your beauty. Are, so did you grow all those flowers back? There? I did. I did. So I, the Valentine's day flowers were pre-chilled ones that I bought from the ladies at the tulip workshop. Um, but these were ones that I bought from Ball Horticulture, Edney, Ball, Edney, whatever it is, um, Glockner, um, that I chilled myself in my cool butt um, this winter. And then, but I didn't do that many because I wasn't, I was a little more confident in the pre-chilled ones. It seemed like those are more straightforward. 
Um, so I just did a few of each variety to kind of see which ones were going to be the best for forcing that we ch chill ourselves because to get it this far in, into the spring, you have to chill it yourself. Um, so I, I grew them all. I have a question though, since I have two experts here and I, our hellebores are starting to get like the seed pod look to them. Yes. yes. And so I've been cutting them and a lot of that. So the property happens to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hellebores and yeah. thousands and thousands of, of narcissus. We actually grew a bunch of new specialty narcissus um, in the flower field, but the hellebores are existing, but a lot of them are kind of down facing. They're not all that like up face that I think I'd want in a bouquet. So my question is like, what, when you, Lisa has a webinar about hell, hellebores and, and I certainly know Ellen buys hellebores cause I bought them from her, I think <laughs> in my bucket. Um, but just like, how do you know, like how long does the stem need to be? Like, do they ever like, do they have to be facing up? Do they, where are some more? I think I have more hellebores in here. But like, Ellen, how do you know what's a good one? How, how would you use some facing downs? Um, yeah. We do. Uh, I mean, a lot of them are facing down and not just hellebores. You know, I feel like daffodils this time of year, you know, a lot of those heads are are down facing. And it's not really until you get into like the really new varieties of a lot of things that they're starting to engineer heads that will stand up more. Um, yeah. So for us, like we're used to it and we are either going to like if it's in a bouquet where they have to get propped up, we're going to put a flower underneath them and prop the head up. Um, oftentimes we'll use them in vase arrangements and we'll just let them be downward facing. You know, that's kind of, you know, that for us, we're always thinking like, what do flowers do in the world naturally and letting them do that in a design. Um, and while we would love if their heads were facing up and, you know, like I said, we do things to make them, I mean, you could wire them. There are florists that will wire them. We just will not, I just can't, I can't get right. Can't get Seems fussy. That. Yeah. And not compostable. It's not, it's not needed for us. Um, while we would love them to be front up, upward facing, you know, downward facing, we will still use in design. We, you know, they mimic what happens in the yard. So, um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. I would say for me, like the one big thing or two big things, one is stem length, right? Because hellebores can be very short. So the longer you can get them, even that one you have there, Sarah, even if it's a, even if it's a branched one, that's fine. As long as you have, you know, 12 inches or so um, sure. on the length. And then the seed pod, you're right. Like we always, um, we always, I mean, you could look in the ASCFG post harvest care book. Yeah, too. I have that. Yes. It, um, it doesn't say that's, it doesn't, I, I did look at, I did look at it. Yeah, okay. Oh, I have mine book. right here too. <laughs> Everybody's got their post harvest care. But it didn't say like an expe expected stem length. And so these I cut a bit of the stem off just to fit them into the, the compost yeah. that I was making just for the house. Um, I would but like, see how some of them are like this yeah, like, and some are in this, in the seed pod. They're just so much prettier before they go to seed pod. They are, but I will but say they wilt. That, that is what yes. is going to wilt. Even yes. if you cut it with one bloom as a seed pod and the others have the, the stamen still on them, those will <laughs> wilt and the seed pod one will stay. So even though, I mean, if you look at Instagram. So you want the seed pods then, yes. for sure. Every picture okay, on Instagram is pre-seed pod. I know that. However, oh, they look great in a picture. They will not hold up in a design. You really yeah. do want to wait till the seed pod. Unless you have a florist that just really wants that look and you give them the risks. Um, for us, we will always ask a farmer um, if it's in seed pod stage, because we have bought, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands of dollars worth of hellebores that have wilted because they're not harvested late enough. So yeah, you're right on with the seed pod. I would wait. I would try to wait. And, and how many so, blooms do you expect on a stem? Like, I mean, if you could get that, that, that branch, two, yeah. yeah, that would be great. And then, then do you cut off these little guys? Should you I cut them off or leave them for you to cut them off? Yeah. Okay. Leave them and let us cut them. That way you give okay. the forest the, the decision to do what they want with them. Thank you. How about you, Lisa? Any tips for these? Yeah, well, what yeah. I was going to say. Is, flower hellebores. Do you don't, you, did you plant these or they were already there? So you don't know what varieties they are? These were already here. My old house, I planted the new, like the wedding party varieties, yeah. um, which are gorgeous. Um, but these are pre-existing. And I left the wedding party ones for the nice people that bought our house. 
It's sure. Hard. Nope. That's fine because all of mine are basically the old heirloom Orientalis yes. um, in Niger, and they typically just raise their heads as they develop the seed pod. Yes. And that's what I am. I mean, it's like you think I'm in the peony patch three times a day when it's time for peonies. I'm in the hellebore patch, um, you know, at least once a day waiting for them to get to that you know, seed pot is developed enough that they, because they literally lift their heads. But what I was going to say and suggest um, is I have no idea about these new fancy hybrids because the new, the new hybrids, many of them are sterile. They yes. don't actually even develop seeds. Yeah. I mean, I, that just makes me not want to, I bought one years ago and it, it just wasn't nearly as hardy. So I have no experience with them to share with you, but um when they all get to the seed pod stage, I don't know if you would agree with this, Ellen. From what I see, there is not a whole lot of difference in those $30 plants no. and my reseeding orientaluses at the proper harvesting stage. Yeah. So, you know, it's everybody's to their own. And I see people, like Ellen said, harvesting them long before they have seed pods. But I I'm not willing to do those extra you know, CPR is what we call it. If you need CPR, I'm sorry, you have come to the wrong place. <laughs> you know, we just don't go to those extra levels of um, support for anything. Yeah. Um, so, but yours are gorgeous. Gorgeous. Oh, thanks. Um, now I will pass that one on. I'll put them on a availability <laughs> list. So just see, yeah. I mean, just watch them and see. And we just found I could sell a whole lot more of them with a whole lot more confidence that they were going to hold for, I mean, we got top dollar for years um, for them because they did last so long. And that was because their heads were yeah. up and had seed pods. Yeah. Like yeah. three weeks when it, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. They, they're just like, they're kind of everlasting. It feels like yes, for a while. For sure. For sure. Well, girls, this has been delightful to talk to you. Is there anything else you would like to add, Sarah? Mm, just enjoy all the seasonality of these local flowers and how we get them for a little bit and then you get something new. I think it just makes the whole thing exciting and fun and gives you a chance to be creative. So I think that's the best thing that I learned from Ellen and from you. Well, thank you for that. And I just, I'm, I think Ellen and I agree that you are like our dream poster girl now, you know, I mean, it's just really, really neat to see the full circle um, of being able to do it. And I think you'll be an inspiration to a lot of people. Yes. Um, and I know that Ellen's course, um, growing your business with, um, local sourcing, sourcing. Mm -hmm. and, um, is so beneficial from the farmer side. Um, because I, Sarah, I feel like you're on the same page as I am. I want to know more than I need to know. Mm -hmm. I want to know what my customer is thinking and seeing and what they need and what their struggles are. And, um, so I'm just so glad that that whole relationship was cuddled and started by Ellen and, um, good job, Ellen. Thanks, everyone. And thank Sarah, you so much. You're so welcome. And thank you. And in, I'm just so glad to have you part of our industry. And so, friends, if you want, so Sarah, how can people connect with you on social media? Uh, we're at, at Strawberry Hill MD without any punctuation. Okay. On Instagram, sorry. On Instagram, and then we have Facebook. Awesome. And then it, uh, there's a link to our website from our Instagram. Okay. And how about you, Ellen? Uh, everybody can find me at Local Color Flowers on all the things, Instagram, Facebook, and our website is locoflow.com. And so friends, if you want to learn more about the Gardener's Workshop and the work that we're doing and our online courses that Sarah was, had mentioned and that Ellen and I are both instructors for, you can learn about it over at thegardenersworkshop.com and we'd love to have you join the party. Um, and friends, until we meet again. Ciao.